Welcome. Uh, tonight's presentation is the feature of conversational AI. Our presenter is Dr. Junling Hu. Uh, she's the Director of Applied AI at LivePerson. Um, so this is an event of the San Francisco Bay Area ACM. The San Francisco Bay Area ACM, it was founded in 1957. Objective is to promote the knowledge of modern computing. We wanna create community, support networking and hiring. Um, if you'd like to post in the chat channel, if your company is hiring uh, data science or related positions, uh, please do so. If other people wanna network with you and we can set up something for offline conversations. As you just heard, uh, Jun Ling, the speaker, was saying that it worked out for her. Um, I've found a job or two myself here and hired a few people here as well. Our membership is only $20 a year. Uh, we're a nonprofit, 501c3. Any donations will be tax deductible. Uh, we have upcoming talks you can find in our meetup. We have over 11,000 members in our meetup. Go to sf-bay-acm. And we have over 185 past talks on our YouTube channel with about 5,000 subscribers. In general, we have two monthly meetings, uh, general computing and a data science SIG. Although this is an example of a month where we have two back-to-back -back data science talks. Uh, sometimes it's a matter of the bounty of speakers that we find. Some of the upcoming ACM events. Uh, tomorrow, we have implicit neural representation networks fitting signals, derivatives, and integrals uh, by uh, two people from Stanford University. That'll be joint with uh, Silicon Valley SIGGRAPH. Um, and then Saturday and Sunday this weekend, we have a hands-on quantum computing primer. Uh, so that'll be 10 to one on Saturday and 10 to one on Sunday. Uh, so Borav Metia has uh, been a, a past uh, speaker at a number of ACM events and he's always uh, been good at uh, giving tutorials. A very energetic speaker. On Monday, February 28th, we have Weight Watcher. No, not about weight loss, but about neural net weights. It's an open source diagnostic tool for analyzing deep neural nets. Uh, Dr. Charles Martin, uh, founder of Calculation Consulting, is also an NSF fellow. Uh, so those are some of our upcoming talks. Uh, to go into a little bit details on the weekend event, hands-on quantum computing primer, theory to application. Um, so uh, let's see, there's a, uh, some of the registration codes. Uh, Bill and Leanna, is the discount code uh, still good if we use the member 20? Well, I assume it is. Um, if anyone in the audience would like to take a screenshot, go ahead. Um, and I won't read through, but here's the syllabus of the three sections that'll be covered over the two days. Uh, so this will be going through a lot of the details of the quantum computing. Also, if you have other questions, Yash's contact info is on the bottom right there. Uh, so if you're interested, I'll wait a few seconds for a screenshot. And this will also be on our Meetup site. So you can use chat and Zoom. Uh, you can type questions for the speaker. And uh, my name is Greg Mikowski. I'm the moderator tonight. And I'll bring up the questions to the speaker just to help her out. Um, if there's technical issues you have, and again, for announcements of job related. Um, or other events that people might be interested. So to introduce tonight's talk. Um, so over the last two years, we've seen rapid development of conversational AI technology. Uh, she's gonna review two types of dialogue systems, open domain chatbots and task-oriented chatbots. The open domain chatbots can make a conversation on any subject. The task-oriented chatbots serve the user for specific needs, such as ordering food or booking a ticket. Uh, she'll discuss the success and challenges in both domains, and she's going to share the work at Live Person, where she works, for providing conversational AI solutions to more than 1,800 enterprise customers. For some of Jolene's background, she leads a team on natural language understanding and conversational AI. She's the author of the book, Evolution of Artificial Intelligence. You can certainly find that on Amazon. A recipient of an NSF Career Award. Uh, she was the director of data mining at Samsung, um, and also PayPal, eBay, and Bosch. She got her PhD in AI from the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. So now help me uh, give a warm applause to Jun Lin. We have to figure out a better chat way to share applause. Thank uh, you, Greg. I'll stop sharing and you can go ahead and share yours. Sure, let me share my screen. All right, can everyone see my slides? Yes, we can. 
And also okay, sometimes then. generally the audience asks for a copy of the slides and we just ask if a speaker can make a PDF and then post a link to the meetup. Like in the uh, uh, meetup for this event, then there's a, a section where you can add comments. So in that comment section, if you could, uh, when you get a chance, just post a link to your slides and people are usually appreciative of that, so. Okay, all right. Awesome, so please continue on, thank you. Sure, so thanks everyone for coming to the talk today. I'm going to talk about uh, my understanding about the future of conversational AI. And certainly Greg mentioned that I will talk a little bit about a live person, um, but today um, I may mainly focus on the field itself. And then I, I will talk a little bit about, about the live person at the end. So when we think about the conversational AI, we didn't realize, probably many of us didn't realize it's, it's already in our life and it become more and more prevalent. If you look at uh, the small robot that now comes to home to teach children to uh, interface with uh, older people, they are going to have this uh, uh, conversational capability. Also, be, besides Alexa, Google Home, we are seeing that uh, we are carrying those conversational devices into cars and Alexa will have this in-car capability to uh, when it's linked to the internet. So in our daily life, the human machine interface with natural language conversation becomes very uh, already being well accepted. So that is uh, the uh, consumer aspect. Now, in terms of uh, commercial aspect from business side, the natural language dialogue provide an interface to support the customer to to help the customer resolve issues and also do IT support, do um, transaction, and, and also there's uh, uh, additional for using natural interface to like uh, resolve many issues. So here is the e-commerce application, but consider that for for banking, for airline, for many, many uh, potential verticals, you can have those uh, interface. And Google demo demonstrated uh, like ordering pizza. So those are the uh, commercial applications. Inside the big enterprise, we will see natural, inter uh, natural language interface for, for job interview. Uh, basically, they can do the, uh, the first round of filtering for HR, uh, internal training, and for many other aspects uh, on the job. So those are the natural language interface that we see. They uh, essentially, when we think about UI, well, when we in the 90s, in the two, uh, early 2000s, when we build a computer application, we are thinking about a, a box that a user can click on uh, buttons. Those days, I think, uh, will gradually phase out. And now we arrived at the time where conversation becomes a natural interface with computer. So, and that is what we are going to expect the computer to do. So, how do we build a chatbot? The if if a chatbot interface or what do we call dialogue interface? Uh, is the nat natural interface for the future between human and machine. The, then the question is, how do we build a, a system that can interface with us naturally in, and uh, more human-like? So traditionally, the dialogue system design has gone through like, in the last 40 years. Basically, it's based on this uh, simple, very traditional architecture. That is, uh, we have uh, several modules inside the dialogue system. The first module is called the natural language understanding. It, uh, it takes the user input, trying to identify what the user is trying to say. So intended detection, uh, slot filling may meaning discover the major entities that the user is trying to uh, ask about. So that could be, say play a song by Whitney Houston, those names, those how we fill in those slot. Um, if you are booking a ticket, you say you would say um, departure, the departure city is San Francisco. So those, those are the slots we need to identify.
magnify, and also we got identify the intention. With, with that, the dialogue management helps the user maintains the, the complete state, uh, understanding where we are in the context. It also has a general policy to interface with the backend so, so that you can retrieve the song, it can book the ticket, or in, and, the, and the give the user more information about, say, movie time, uh, theaters, not, uh, where the theater is. The uh, natural language generation is the part where you talk to the user. Uh, the machine actually constructed the answer in the natural language way, uh, conversation way. So that involves a certain kind of uh, understanding about how human would speak certain sentence. So the, each of these uh, box has been well started and been basically the last 40 years in the uh, natural language conference, in the dialogue conference, people are working on that. However, the progress with the dialogue system has been very, very slow. The main reason is uh, it, it, it's, uh, it's the last domain where the AI has not made major breakthrough. The reason is the complexity of different modules. The second is it's harder to get. Uh, it's harder to get uh, the. Um, it's harder to to get uh, all the labeled data for for people to to basically to understand at each turn what the user is trying to do. So, so all, because of all of these difficulties, the progress with real chatbot is still very slow. But that is changing in the last two years, actually only in two years, since late 2019. The, oh, I see, I hear some echo here. Um, someone has not been muted, okay. Anyway, so the so the the what the progress is made through actually create a new architecture that is very different from traditional architecture. So how do we build a dialogue system? Now, if we treat the whole system as a black box, essentially you can think about the user question is the input, the answer from the system is the output. If we can just learn this this is a kind of black box system as a neural network. Can we actually create a very uh, reasonable human-like conversational system? So that is the that is the promise, right? That is the uh, ideal. And, the, and the, what is inside this uh, black box? The what we are seeing in the last two years is uh, the the rise of a transformer that enabled this kind of uh, black box to be possible. Before that, uh, people tried many other, like reinforcement learning, they tried the uh, uh, recurrent neural network, all different kind of architecture, but uh, those uh, hasn't achieved a very good result. Only after transformer, particularly transform, uh, after transformer, we, we have a more pre-trained model. So so that, that, that totally changed the, the landscape. So let me just uh, quickly, for those of you who may be still new to Transformer, um, the high level architecture of a Transformer essentially is a new uh, feed forward neural network with, uh, with six layer, the uh, first design of Transformer is a six layer of encoder, six layer of decoder. And uh, you basically take an input uh, as a sequence basically a sequence of tokens and output is a sequence of tokens. So the transformer is, was designed for, the, for handling natural language. The initial application for transformer was for machine translation. That, but the natu very naturally you can think about, you can, we can easily extend this to a dialogue where the input is a user question, the output is the system answer. So that is uh, how we adapt transformer to dialogue system. Now, the uh, what makes transformer powerful is the so-called pre-trained model on Wikipedia on many large data set. The reason is uh, with pre-trained model, we learned the language properties from many, many articles. 
So the, the natural language relationship the, between words was learned through the pre-training. And the, those, those, those knowledge makes the nat uh, neural network much more uh, knowledgeable. Basically, it's encoding the human knowledge inside the neural network. So the, there are many architectures proposed. The first, the most successful one was BERT. So BERT used the encoder part, but they only used the left part. The, the not, uh, I wouldn't call left, I would say the first is, uh, part is the encoder, the second part is decoder. So the first part, encoder, ro BERT and Robota. Robota basically is a, a more refined BERT. The, both uh, only use encoder architecture. The GPT from OpenAI, they use a decoder, only decoder architecture. So GPT, GPT-2, GPT-3, those, they are very powerful models, but they only use a decoder. Then people say, why not we use the complete architecture called the in plus encoder plus decoder? So this gives rise to T5 uh, from Google, uh, designed in Google. T5 stands for text-to-text -text transfer transformer. And then BART from Facebook. So both are a complete transformer with both encoder and the decoder. They, and they are pre-trained on a very large corpus of text. And if we want to really build the dialogue system, we would like to have, uh, have a way to speak back to the user. So we do need to generate a sentence. So only with decoder inside the system, we can generate. So dialogue system essentially either use the decoder based GPT or use the encoder plus decoder based system. Now, the uh, many of you are familiar with uh, the BERT or GPT. I just want to give a very quick uh, uh, introduction to T5 and the BERT. The, so we know BERT is trained on the mask language model. We mask uh, certain words and then predict those words inside the output. So that's BERT, how BERT was trained. The T5 uh, has uh, two differences from BERT. One is uh, its training corpus is much larger than BERT. BERT originally used the Wikipedia, the whole Wikipedia collection of Wikipedia articles. But uh, T5 was trained on the uh, the crawled corpus from the whole internet. So that is uh, way larger than the Wikipedia uh, collection. Secondly, is uh, the mask language model used in T5, the way they mask the words, they, they can mask multiple words and then recover those multiple words in the output. So this is a much power, more powerful than BERT. Uh, for T5, it, it, is, uh, it is also a, encoder decoder. So the way they mask the, the input is even more general. So they can mask with uh, like change the order. They, they can flop, uh, flip the first sentence and the second sentence. They can put the, uh, even change the uh, word order. They can make the reverse order. So, and they permute, they can permute the input. So with all of this, they, they, still can recover the original sentence. So this is way, way more powerful than simply mask a few words uh, in, as in BERT. So with these two kind of T5 and BART, the whole field is uh, being able to generate much more powerful uh, response. It, so if we look back and at the development of transformer, you can see a timeline here where Transformer originally was invented in 2017. BERT was late 2018. Then uh, in 2019, all the architecture I just mentioned started to appear. GPT-2, T5, BART, and the GPT-3 is just a much larger version of GPT-2. So it, it appeared in 2020. And the dialogue system revolution, what I call revolution, happens only after this model appears. So if you look at the real uh, viable system that can compete with human conversation is that the first is uh, dialogue G GPT, which is based on GPT-2 architecture. It's, it was invented in November, 2019. After that, Google had the MENA, which is tr uh, based on an evolved transformer. Then Blendbot from Facebook was based on BART. We have a, uh, one year later, a, li a little over one year later, we have a blend about two. 
and that is more intelligent than Blendbot. And that uh, appeared in July, 2021. And so if we plot this on the time scale, uh, on the timeline, you can see that the dialogue GPT is like in late 2019 and a lot of development happens in 20, 2020. The, this, all this is also enabled by T5 and BART. So, uh, and then blend about two is in the, right in the middle of 2021. So as you can see the, um, we are much more optimistic about building a real open domain chatbot because the, what, what is required in the open domain chatbot? So first let's, uh, let's look at the, all the possible system, dialogue system. Essentially we can divide into two types. One type is called the open domain, where you the, the 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 bot can talk about anything. You can talk, you can ask anything. They are supposed to be able to engage you in the conversation. So essentially, this is what Turing Alan Turing envisioned uh, about that can fool you like a human. That you when you chat with this system, you don't know whether you are talking to a real person or a computer. That is the the ultimate vision, and it's a very fast approaching become a reality now. And you and you can see you actually you can test that with the current brand about two. <clears throat> the second one, which actually turns out uh, counterintuitively harder than the first one. The second type of system we call task oriented dialogue system. It's a, it's like a simple system to book a hotel, order food, ask for weather. Uh, playing a song, simple system, but they somehow become, they were much harder to design than the open, they made the less, I would say make, made the less progress in the last two years than the open domain dialogue system. And we will, we'll, we'll see why as we, uh, in this talk. So let me first introduce all the open domain dialogue system, because this is, uh, in this in this path in this branch we have a lot of progress so how how were we able to make those progress um, so we can take a look at the, the full system I just mentioned first is dialogue GPT dialogue dialogue GPT they basically take a GPT2 architecture of 12 decoder layers then they uh, train that on the reddit data uh, on, on Reddit, there are many forum. In each forum, people like comment on each other. So you can consider that as a more like a dialogue. And there are 147 million uh, text, uh, line of text. So those are, you can think about this like exchange. So this is uh, not a real dialogue data, but uh, they can give you the conversational uh, like words, the way people say things. So it's kind of close to a dialogue data. So that is a huge amount of training data. And this is the reason why open domain dialogues make made much faster progress because they have way more data than the task oriented dialogue system. So if you look at a, a task oriented dialogue system, typically it's built by a company and the company has to interface with the user. They, they collect uh, some user data but they don't have enough data to train the big, very big neural network. Then that is the major uh, obstacle we are facing today. So with the open domain, with the dialogue GPT, the next advance is uh, uh, early 2020. So Google released the MENA. The MENA has a very special architecture. So it's not a, a pure transformer. It is a transformer, but it's uh, the, it's not like six encoder, six decoder. Instead, they have one encoder, 13 decoder. And why do they have that number? Is because they, they evolved architecture through neural architecture search. So that is some automated way to figure out how many layers we should have and what had, what's in, inside each layer. So they, they basically treated the the uh, internal activation function as a part of the parameter they should uh, uh, optimize on. So they can select using either layer norm or not using layer norm. They can select whether use ReLU or use another activation function. So all these are the options. 
then and then they search through the search base. So that's how they ended up with this uh, very interesting architecture. What did they show the uh, a big progress made by Mina is they automate they automated the evaluation uh, criteria instead of ask a human to evaluate how well a dialogue system uh, did. They use a generic measurement called the sensibility, sensibility and the specific, specificity. So sensibility certainly um, normally you can uh, they, they they basically showed that it's it is it's directly corresponding to the the complexity of the documents, right? The generated sentence. So and we can measure language complexity in our gen generated words. So that is a big achievement. Secondly, they showed that their system, the human achieved the 86% sensibility and their system achieved the 79%. So very close to human performance, which is very interesting. Just out of curiosity, can you describe sensibility a little bit more? I mean, how could I find out my sensibility score? I submit some text of my email or something? Um, uh, sensibility, is a human evaluation criteria. So, so the two human evaluation criteria. It, uh, you mean you're asking what does it mean to be sensible? Is that your term, question? Like you're using the term sensibility, and I'm just wondering a little bit more detail behind that as a numeric metric. So at each turn, at each turn of a conversation, they ask the the human to to evaluate. Does this make sense? So that's a sensibility. So makes sense is if the answer is supposed to be there. And so of course, if you say yes or no, those make sense. But uh, if it's not specific, they your specificity also decrease. So they they the actual measurement is the average of sensibility and the specificity. So you want to, to have both. Yeah. Here I only show the sensibility here. Yeah. Um. Okay, so be, besides the blender bot, we went uh, the the set, the third innovation from Facebook, uh, which is from Facebook, is the so called uh, uh, this blender bot where it blended many skills. And so the what's unique about the blender bot is to use a question answering mechanism to retrieve the answer and then sort those answers by so this allows it to remember many things it learned from Wikipedia, right? So if you ask me, who is Elon Musk, then the system actually knows because they remember, they learned, they pre-trained on Wikipedia, so they have the answer. So they they give you maybe top 10 candidates. Then my the dialogue system will select and rank them and generate the answer. So they will combine the generation with retrieval. This is a very different from very generic dialogue system, just uh, generate word by word to give you the answer. So what they say with retrieval, you, you are able to take advantage of a lot of open domain knowledge out there. The, yeah, so this is just the steps. So, but the architecture, neural network architecture, they invented a, a architecture called a poly encoder. Poly means multiple, so more than two, meaning they have more than two encoders in their system. They have an encoder to encode the context. The context could be previous turns, previous conversation. The, and then they have another encoder encoded to retrieve the result and what are the possible candidate to talk back. And then they merge, they concatenate them into the output through certain kind of attention mechanism. And finally, that will give them a score on what, uh, which one to select. So, the, so this is a unique architecture just for BlendBot. I, later, they actually not using this architecture anymore. Uh, at that time, it really helped the first generation of BlendBot. The, so as I said, the in Blender Border 2, they simplified the architecture. So if you think about the retrieval method, how do we retrieve? The essentially, uh, so they invented this so-called dense passage retrieval, which is end to uh, can be trained through machine learning. 
And then they use a BART to sort to all uh, the BART, as I said, it's a complete transformer. They use that to, to generate the output. So this, uh, I'm not going to go into detail of dense passage retrieval, but that's a, a system that can be trained using BART as inside. But the most interesting part of Blend, the second version of BlendBot is they simplified, they don't have multi-part so-called poly encoder. They just have these uh, parallel encoders with no fancy uh, complex, very simplified. So it's just concatenation. Uh, with, so they still do retrieval. They retrieve multiple possible. Uh, so if you are asking who is Elon Musk, they probably have the first uh, Wikipedia article. Maybe the second is from the some Tesla website, uh, introduct, uh, the company leader, uh, bio, maybe there's another passage from uh, another website, maybe biography website. So with all of these different passage, they concatenate them in the encoder. Each has its own encoder. Then they merge them together in one decoder. And that one decoder will give them the answer. So this is called a fusion in decoder architecture. And this dramatically simplified the previous architecture. The and, and you can see this, this picture is a little small, but, uh, but you can see here in the BlenderBot 2, you uh, basically you have the, the user, user query comes in, you have multiple encoders, then you just uh, send them to, to the decoder. There are two extra components here. One is the internet, as you, if you can see the cloud, the another is at the bottom, so-called long-term memory. So this, these two are the, are the two new modules with BlenderBot 2. So if we, you, uh, we go back to the new capabilities with BlenderBot 2, is uh, they remember what you said yesterday. They re, uh, the bot would remember, sorry, the bot would remember maybe from one month ago. So it has a long-term memory. How, how did they do that? Is, uh, is the, uh, their chatbot is able to, whenever it starts, whenever they see a user, they will check the user history. So they, they have a way to merge the old user conversation and get the most relevant information into the current context. So that is the innovation they did. That, and I think it's very, very important for building a chatbot. The second part is they search the uh, they are able to, during conversation, they can search new information on the internet. And that is, uh, that is also very powerful because, uh, for example, if we ask about a certain basketball uh, player, maybe this year they changed the team. So the information may, what we learned trained on Wikipedia, maybe the old uh, knowledge and the model maybe from last year. So any new information they can give you the, through the search, uh, dynamic search, during conversation, they can give you updated information. So with this two capability, um, BlenderBot 2, let me show you the final result of uh, the comparison between BlenderBot 2 with Mina. The, and you can see that, first of all, they have uh, several different size of model. There's 2.7 billion parameter model. There are 90 million parameter model and uh, there's 9.4 billion. In, interestingly, the best performing model is the 2.7 billion with uh, BST stands for blended scale task, which is the core architecture of BlenderBot. So um, with the, this, this is uh, basically, they got uh, some crowd workers to sort, to evaluate the answer against the MENA. Uh, 75% with the best model, 75% of the time, they perform better than Mina, right? So, so it's like a three to one if it's game. And the, this is much better than BlendBot 2. They, in BlendBot 2, they showed that they were they, about of like 49, a little less than the BlendBot 2. So, so this is a very, that, and we know Mina is uh, very close to human, right? Human is 86, Mina is 79. If uh, BlenderBot 2 is four, four times, three times uh, 
as good as Mina, then imagine how close it is to human, right? right. So potentially we can directly evaluate against the human performance. So, so okay. this is, yeah. Are you ready to play Jeopardy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so this is, uh, I, think, I think probably they can, yeah. I, I, because actually they, there is this open domain uh, question answer game so there are several data set when the data set is uh, basically you can ask any question it's an open domain it's almost like a jeopardy so the in this they evaluate different uh, different models the underlying model fusion in decoder is the one for for blender 2 and you can see that the performance um comparing to the previous model they are significantly better and I would say 10%, 10 percent percentage point. Uh, so, so on the uh, on the right side uh, in the column, so NQ EM, I think it's a natural question that's uh, constructed uh, constructed by Google team from the Wikipedia articles. So you can ask any question from basic natural question, but then remove the passage. You don't you cannot read the original article anymore. So, so these these are the different data sets which all these they show across the board they should, they were better than the previous model. There's a question from the audience in the chat window uh, okay. it was from Pradeep. Uh, he was asking, have you read or considered a comparison with Raza? Uh, it's a Raza.com is a link he, he uh, listed. Yeah, Raza is not comparable to any of the model I mentioned here. Uh, Raza is not uh, Raza is not a design for end to end. Rasa is designed for supporting the classical modular system to do better job in intended classification, do better job in generation, and so in each modules. Um, potentially, you you can certainly apply the Rasa architecture to this, but I don't think. Uh, um, and that e even the paper here, it's not uh, it's not the same scale. So if you if you look at it, the all the comparison here, there's no rasa here. Okay, so the so I'll, now I talk about I want to switch gear to a second type of dialogue system because so far as we can see, it's a very we are very successful generating a conversation, and you can see the sample dialogue from the. Facebook website, uh, Facebook blog, uh, par.ai, par par.ai, which is their uh, NLP website for the dialogue system. So they show the many interesting conversational examples in original paper, in the paper on Blendable 2, they also have many conversation examples. You can also download and try in, in the Google Colab, you can get a, a actual real conversation come back. So that's very interesting, which I was very impressed. Uh, we did the actual evaluation. We talk with the bot. The, the sentence comes back with uh, almost a human, like uh, you, you, can, you, you really cannot tell it's not uh, from hu uh, a machine, right? It's not from a human. It's, uh, it's just amazing. I was... Uh, very much amazed, even though I was in this field for many years. So, so, so that we we feel that we we are close to a breakthrough. Maybe we are already reached the human level performance, uh, but the people try to be modest. I think they don't want to actually say we actually did. But if you really do some uh, blend test, I say personally, when I when I tested the two point seven billion model. I feel they were able to like do at least 20 turns with me without me feeling I'm talking to a machine. So that is the current state of art, which is I certainly feel very successful we have achieved. But for, for our purpose, for my research work and for many people who are currently working building dialogue system, with our concern, um, the current work is to build a so-called task-oriented dialogue system. We would like to build a dialogue chatbot that can help you do something. So either book a ticket or uh, buy something on the internet or do additional things for the user. So the, 
um, uh, this is just to give you a quick uh, uh, overview for the three systems I'm going to mention here. And they are developing a little after, after the uh, open domain dialogue system. And it's uh, many happened at the, the, the last half of 2020. There are one new paper coming out in the late 2021. Uh, so I won't mention today, but it's a continuing progress. The, so the difficulty of building an end-to-end task-oriented data system is that there are several things we need to pay attention. One is what are you user trying to do? What kind of specific task the user is uh, trying to accomplish? So in order to encode this into a dialogue system, the, the way we do that, if we really do want to do end-to-end, -end, uh, so this is the first system came out in end, uh, beginning of 2020, is uh, the, we would like the input to capture all the information about the dialogue, which including the context, my current belief, what is the user action, what is the, if I'm training the system, I will also put the, I will also put the response in the input so that we use the encoder to, do, to duplicate the system. So what they did is with the uh, encoder, but they shifted the output by one word. So essentially it's like you one word predict the next token. With this simple architecture, they were able to, and then you train on many, many labeled data. So, so you concatenate all the context into, context means all the rounds of conversation into one big block. And then you have another block of belief. What, is, what do you believe? What, what is the current uh, possible things to do? And then action is, uh, is what the user ask, right? And finally, what is should be the response? The and then in the inference state, that that was for training. In the inference stage, you don't have the response, so you only take the first few part. You send it to the network, and then you let the network generate the next token at the end of the the last response, last part of the input. And so the the first the initial the simple TOD is trained on seven domains, seven data sets uh, called the multi-domain without of odds. So this is a public training data they can train from. Um, they include the restaurant, the train, attraction, hotel, taxi, hospital, and the police. The, and they showed some good performance, but it's not that great. And actually, so maybe it's accuracy around 57%. So it's not, not there, not a like in the open domain chatbot. So the, the main uh, complexity here is you, we have many things we're learning. We're learning context, we're learning belief, we're learning action, and then database search results. So we have like five major things to learn. They are all different things but we can take them together to in the input. And this is a considered too complex. So how can we simplify this? The, the next approach called a ticket talk is basically simplify, remove the so-called belief state, remove the, um, even the um, additional, like a search result. So the, all, all that's left is the context and the input. And so how do I explain this? The, okay, so here, um, essentially they treat everything as token. So the, the ticket five was built on T5. T5 is treating all the input text as tokens. So the, all the conversation is annotated by user agent and then user. The only thing they are learning is the action. The action is the uh, API call. So each API call has some attributes. So, so they merge the the you the the turn by turn concatenation with the action. They all is indicated by this bracket. So that is the, all you learn is learning either the words by itself or the action by itself. So it's just a two set of problem to learn. Anyway, this is, uh, 
I'm not going to detail, but that's a high level of high level um, feeling for this. Uh, a user question or audience question? Um, okay. Uh, Jay Wu was asking, how long does it take to train these models? Or what's a, a range of the training time? And I imagine going along with that is, you know, how many GPUs are you using or what's your hardware like? Yeah, uh, this takes a couple of weeks, uh, I believe one week. Um, for for ticket talk, it's smaller. For simple uh, TOD, it's larger, so it takes longer. For simple ticket talk, it only handles one domain. So it doesn't take, a, I believe it's one or two days. It In the old days, when we say it takes too long, normally it's the GPU capacity, right? So, but with parallel training, you can, with a particular transformer, allow you to parallelly train the parameters. That, uh, so you can definitely do multiple GPUs. So, so is, this, is this with like two GPUs, 200 GPUs, or what's the ballpark that you're talking about for a few days or for a week? This, I don't remember. Uh, we have to refer to the original paper. Yeah. I see, okay. Okay. The, I want to show you the data set that they were using. So in order to train the end-to-end -end, uh, ticket talk, they, they use a dialogue with about 2000, all labeled. So the, the downside of this is you need a lot of labeled data in order to, in order to basically what what they are labeling is the the action what's inside the action right otherwise it's just the next next response. So the label is minimal for every turn, but you still need to label. So that is, that is the downside. You you need to label the data. The Oh, so the, here's how we formulate the training data. You, you, you take the history of conversation and then you annotate, annotate say user said this and the agent, so A means agent respond. And with the second round, you added the context from previous round in, inside to as all the inputs. So that should be your second data points. The second data point in, include the previous context as a part of the input. And then the API call is the real annotation we need to do. Is uh, that is the uh, the PN? PN means the program name. So the so basically the uh, so the name is a finding a movie. That's an API call name. Then you have what is inside the value, the the actual action name and the value. Then the in uh, the system then search in the movie database give you a response. So PR basically is the program response, and the response has a name. It's a name dot movie that give you all the na name of the movie, and it, so it returns the value two values John Wick and Jack Ryan. So those are the two uh, values returned. In this third round, you include the previous context as a part of the conversation, and then you get the answer. So, so this is just uh, show that how we build the training data for the this kind of task oriented dialogue system. The and they also use make sense as a, as a part of the measurement. And makes sense basically. Greg asked about in here is very specific whether is the answer relevant. Secondly is, uh, did they get the right result? And when we evaluate, they showed that the uh, more data give better performance. The, so from 5K to 21K, so they try to just use the 5,000 for training that gave them certain kind of, certain kind of accuracy. But even with uh, small data, they got a very good accuracy. Uh, and then and all this is pre-trained, uh, using pre-trained uh, T5 model. If they don't use a pre-trained model, use a 10,000, but only 10,000 uh, labeled data to train, the, uh, the accuracy decreases by 30%. So it's only 55.8%. That is a dramatic difference. And so essentially that language model pre-training is very important. And they showed that, uh, so the red is uh, the model, the blue is the human, and that we are re very much approach the human performance. 
So this is very promising, at least for this single domain, it's very powerful. The, the only thing is you, when you see the number, number of turns increase goes to above five, then the computer became worse than the human. So that means over time, the, when the context become larger, the computer has to is currently struggle with remembering all the previous conversation, but the human has a better chance doing that. So this is the second, uh, I would say um, all kind of, uh, it is a state of art approach for handling task oriented dialogue system. But there's one more development for task oriented dialogue system is the, is uh, on how, the yeah. question on the previous slide, is yeah. there a calculation on the memory capacity as a function of the number of weights in the neural net? You were saying as the the uh, number of turns increases or the amount of data increases for the model to return, it slowly degrades a little bit. It sounds like there's a memory capacity limitation. Is there any heuristics on that? Um, yeah, I believe the paper probably mentioned. Um, personally, in the model, uh, every model is limited by the input size. So you you take uh, maybe uh, ten forty eight tokens or you take a 20, so double that size, you're still limited. So the number of tokens is limited in input. Computational wise, the transformer computation also is impacted by the lens of the input. So it, it could be quadratic in the input lens. So that right. computation needs to be resolved too. Okay. Yeah, but that is also the current uh, research this year, the past year, there are a lot of recent improvement on transformer that uh, can, convert that from quadratic time to uh, maybe linear time, even reach a linear time. So, so that is uh, possible with uh, future transformer. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so actually there is a new paper about they can do infinite lines. They essentially can do a whole book because once you remove this constraint of input lines require uh, constraint, you can do much, much longer text. So it may be this paper, I believe this paper for here didn't incorporate that new transformer architecture. It's just T5 is still the traditional transformer. All right, so now let's move on to the last part, the last uh, kind of architecture I want to talk about for building a task oriented dialogue system. The, the many cases, one company want to build particularly like my company, like person, we serve many customers. We have a financial customer, we have a, uh, airline customer, we have a, like uh, uh, healthcare customers, all these customers want to build a conversational bot. So if we build one model for one customer, we don't want to duplicate the work building another model for another customer. And then otherwise you just, if you have a 10, thousand customer, you will have 10,000 models. That, that's one, that's uh, for the cost. Um, in addition, if you are building an intelligent agent, you would like the agent to remember what it learned, what it, what it learned before, right? You don't want to forget just by coming to a new domain to forget everything learned from previous domain. So, so continual learning is a very hot topic in machine learning. The, and how, the, how do we apply that to dialogue system? It's very interesting to see here, it's actually become a possible. So, so as you can see the highlight in the high level, we are, we are so LM indicates, uh, LM, LM here stands for language model. Essentially it's a, it's a pre-trained language model. Basically it's, uh, you can think about it as a transformer based uh, model. So the Q0, uh, theta zero indicated the weights inside of the first model and the theta one is the weights for the second model. So as you can see, when we, when we move from one domain, the hotel domain to the taxi domain, we update our weights. And so we, we gain some new weights, theta one. So you can see the model itself evolve over time, right? It evolve when we encounter new domain. The, the real question is how much loss we, we, we have when we try to learn a new domain. We, lo we lost the old information. 
So that is the one we, we want to learn about. In order to uh, adapt, so two questions. One is how we adapt old model to new model. Secondly is in the new model, how can we combine the old knowledge with new knowledge? So this is the two questions we are asking. So the this paper, uh, this continual continue learning on uh, on task oriented dialogue system, basically trying to answer how we can do this by the, so their solution is taking the transformer architecture, inject one linear layer inside uh, right after the feed forward layer inside the uh, transformer each each encoder layer. So if you add one linear layer right after the feed forward layer, uh, you, you don't learn too many parameters. So the parameter is uh, kind of small. Actually, they made it very small. They made it, you can choose an arbitrary small number, uh, number of nodes to learn. So um, in fact, they have this kind of bottleneck architecture where essentially it's a three layer, linear, three linear layers, but it's the center, in the center of the, the, the second linear layer, it, there's a very few number of nodes there, maybe two or three. So the highlight here, the is three, could be 10, but it's very small comparing like a thousand or 10,000 nodes. So that, that's, that makes the learning much faster. Once you have those, you basically inject a small linear layer on top of each feed forward layer inside the transformer. So for every domain, we have one set of parameter in to indicate that this is specific to this domain. So next time when I move to a new domain, to a taxi domain, I just add a few more nodes parallel to what I learned earlier. So the what's unique about uh, the domain, it can be easily captured in, in those few layers. And if I remove that, I basically, as if I have never learned that domain, right? So you, and you, you can fix the weights for all the other layers. This is how we can adapt to multiple domains. So I, so this, uh, this kind of design is very, very smart and intelligent and it's theoretically sound because they it came from architecture called the adapter residual adapter and the, there is a general paper on how adapter works how it changes the transformer how inside the transformer so those there's a general research on that the so for this work they they basically try to learn, they adapt to 37 domains, right? With 37 data sets. We started with one domain, like movie, then moving to restaurant, then moving to auto. So what they showed, this is a very interesting result, is uh, what they showed here is uh, you, we have uh, the green indicated adapter using their approach, the all the other, uh, colors are other previous approach by other people. And so the horizontal line is the task, the not the index of the task. So you start with uh, task zero, you add a task one, you then move to task two, all the way to task 37, right, 36, because index is from zero. And you can see the green line, even over time by adding new task, it's total accuracy doesn't de degrade much. It stays above 80%, uh, actually above 85%. But uh, our approach, you can see the, the blue, the, the red, they dramatically uh, downgrade, uh, basically degrade after that. And uh, certainly the, like the classical, like L2 is the classical approach that they just don't perform well, it immediately drop to close to zero. So this is a, a very convincing performance result for this uh, continual learning in the task oriented system. On these tasks through time, is it switching between subjects like taxi, airline, hotel, back to taxi? Um, no, so, so basically they go through, they index them from one to 37 here. So okay. yeah, it's an, uh, you can see how they go. Some, they are not necessarily switch, but a few domains repeating each other. It's a different data set though, yeah. I see. 
Yeah, and you can see in the schema guided dialog, they, they don't repeat here on the service home bank, they don't repeat at all. Okay. Yeah. A question from the audience from Nimit. Thank you for the detailed description on task oriented dialog system. What do we envision would be better for real world impact of such systems and the way people lead their lives? Uh, very good question. So when we have a better task oriented dialogue system, certainly all the customer report, uh, customer support agent will be much more meaningful, much more reasonable, right? So right now people struggle talking to a computer agent, which they don't understand what you say. They, they cannot complete the task you want to transfer to a human agent. So if this becomes very successful, essentially uh, we would, you would see much more intelligent uh, conversation, natural conversation. So the impact for this is on the business side, right? They can reduce the number of agents. For personal side, you can talk to any, you can get support much easily because the major frustration is that you, you, are, you are being held on the phone for a long, long time because the number of agents is very limited there. But if you can chat and talk, um, yeah, you can get a service much, much better. You can also, we can also expand this to coaching, to tutoring, to many, many other personal service, right? Financial advice. Yeah, there's, yeah, unlimited things this can do. Question? Other question? No, no other questions at the time. Thank you. Okay, all right. So. Um, last, I want to introduce a uh, live person. The, as I said, the, the work we're doing is, uh, okay, let me give you. So this is a short video about a live person. Let me see. If, okay. Uh, so the company was founded in 1995. Uh, initially, it, but the AI component started only three years ago. The, the initially the company was serving essentially the all the enterprise customers, but now it has all the major enterprise customers. So all the major airlines is our customer. Uh, financial companies, HSBC, GM Financial, and the retail company from Chipotle to Home Depot, uh, they are all, and then T-Mobile or Orange. So, so we have uh, uh, 18,000 enterprise customers that have more than 1 billion conversational data, which is the largest data set you can get for conversation, for task-oriented conversation. So this is a, a place where we want to build, use, uh, support the customer, uh, and we want to build the so task-oriented dialogue system. That is uh, the goal. The what else do I have to say? So the company is uh, ranked as uh, the top uh, most loved company by Newsweek. The uh, and I can tell you, I I joined the company about three months ago. The, so I. The, the culture, the company culture is great. It's just uh, wonderful to be there. The, and uh, as, a, as I said earlier, we are hiring all the, we want a data scientists at all different level from junior to senior level. So if you're interested, you can contact me for, yeah, to ask more about our openings. And with that, I want to, uh, we can open up to Q and A for question answer. Thank you. Uh, there was a question from Liza Lu. 
who are the major researchers applying these techniques to education? So that didn't look like one of your verticals, but I'm not sure if you're aware of the conversational AI being applied to education. Uh, yes, there are um, there are a lot of tutorial bot designed for conversation. So the um, you can take a, a book of mathematics, convert those into question answer, and then build the conversation on top of the question answer. So that uh, there are a lot of effort of doing that. Other question. There's not other questions on the chat, but uh, more from me. Uh, okay. There's been like uh, LSTMs that are used to label images. Like what's the scene going on in the image? Um, is there much interacting with uh, chat bots and images or video at all? So like, let's say a customer is asking for support and he wants to upload, my thingy is broken. Um, and so I, is there any uh, investigation or into that area? It's kind of a multimedia. Uh, yeah, multimedia become very hot uh, early 2021 because of uh, OpenAI's work combining vision transformer with the language transformer. So now we can easily concatenate the text, the multimedia, so text and the image together because they can index the, by the same transformer. Then, yeah, that's uh, definitely, it, this is uh, actually tomorrow I'm giving a talk on the the trend in deep learning is the merge of image and the natural language. That would be that would be great to hear more details about that. Yeah. So if you have another talk on that, you'd like to come back. <laughs> <laughs> Ray? Uh, yes, go ahead. Uh, aside from the chat window, there's the Q&A window. Did you get some questions from there? Oh, I'm sorry. I'll take a look at the Q&A. I was just looking at chat. Um, let's see, somebody was asking, what does SSA stand for? SSA is a sense of the, oh, the, you mean the, for the MENA, right? I think it's a sensibility, specificity, average. So it's a, the, uh, so you, you add the sensibility plus the specificity divided by two. So SSA, I believe that's SSA stands for. It's a okay. measurement for, for the performance. Okay, and the question from uh, Jay is how much history can a bot remember and deliver a contextual personalized answer back to the user? So this would be, um, I guess, history in the conversation. Um, so for the blender bot too, it can remember many, many days ago. Uh, it's really up to how you encode the, the old knowledge so that it can be utilized by the current conversation. The, so they claim they can go back to one month ago. Uh, so you can keep summarizing what you said earlier. Uh, if, if we are not limited by the total length of input, say if every time we can process the whole book, the book length, book length is about 40,000 words or 50,000 words. If that's, that's our like general context, then probably you can do much, much more. Okay. And then in the Q&A section, Harsha was asking, um, there have been attempts to combine knowledge graphs or KGs with DNNs, which were meant for better grounding and world knowledge. How do those compare with purely transformer-based designs? Yeah, transformer encoded those inside the end-to-end -end learning. So normally you don't see knowledge graph at all in the end-to-end -end model. The, those models are supposed for the modular system. For the end-to-end -end system, you, maybe you can incorporate in the early stage, in the retrieval stage. So in the, as a, if we can go back to blend about two architecture, the, let me see. In the, in the early stage, in the query generator, maybe you can incorporate some knowledge there. But uh, other than that, the whole system is uh, end to end. Okay. Um, an anonymous uh, person was asking, what do you think is the best open source speech recognition system? Uh, Google has a very good uh, 
Facebook, Facebook recently has a multilingual speech recognition system that uh, is actually is so powerful. It's, it's trained on the bilingual data. Oh, actually it's trained on the multilingual data, but uh, perform better than the bilingual tra trained the more speech recognition model. So I believe you can get an open source the speech recognition system from Facebook. By the way, the major work we do at Live Person is a text, purely on text based, text messaging. But uh, we just bought a new company called VoiceBase. So we will incorporate, uh, integrate with the voice going forward. Okay. Um, George on the QA was asking when it comes to quality of the results, are they measuring only conversation in English or are other languages being considered? It's not uncommon that chatbots have English bias in their responses and quality. Uh, yes, uh, that's a very good uh, observation. We do, uh, we are trying to do multilingual. So we um, we are building, we actually already deployed the multilingual model so we can handle, right now can handle about 10 languages. We're expanding this year to many more languages. So that is, uh, shouldn't be an issue. I, I think uh, with BERT, with uh, multilingual BERT, which handles more than 100 languages, the, the 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 today's transformer pre-trained transformer all have a multilingual capability thank you um harsha was asking it appears that ticket talk bot has been reduced to a slot filler any comments uh ticket about is reduced being reduced to slot filler uh ticket talk bot yeah uh, it appears it's similar to slot filling. Is that no. a question? Correct. Uh, no, not really. The it's uh, um, the slot is learned. It's uh, it's combined. Yes, you can think about that. There is a slot there. The slot is the action, but it's combined with the response. So you are learning them simultaneously instead of separately. In the classical way, we we have to learn the slot. Now we learn how to do that with the what to do with those slots. So we, we create a strategy, a dialogue strategy to use the slot. Instead in the end-to-end -end system, you, you learn them simultaneously. They're all part of the input, right? So, and also you have to generate them simultaneously. You generate the slot token, you generate the actual word token, the all come together. So this is the difference. Okay. And, and then Harsha was asking, can four chatbots that you have discussed deal with step-by-step -step procedures? Can four chatbots? The, yeah, there's four chatbots that you've discussed in your talk tonight. Yeah. And Harsha was asking, can they deal with step-by-step -step procedures? Like, uh, you know, what the chatbot mean? is providing some kind of support, you know, do step one, do step two, do step three to the end user. I believe that's my interpretation. Step-by-step -step procedures. Right. Uh, normally, when we say step by step, is the, the task oriented dialogue system, right? Right. Right. So, if you have a, essentially the open domain chatbot, is uh, depends on what you ask, they will give you a response. If you have a fixed uh, question, a step by step questions, I believe the answer can certainly come back. Uh, so if I interpret her question correctly, it might be, you know, how do I cook recipe X? And then oh, might be oh yeah, very good. Uh, yes, yes, yes. That's a very good uh, um, application for the open domain. Or, because or they how, how, do I, how do I assemble this IKEA thing I bought? You know, yes. so I think that's the, my interpretation of the question, if I get it correct. Uh, what's your comment or? My comment for that is, uh, uh, that's actually called a closed domain. Uh, I would not use open domain chatbot to do this. I would use the so-called closed domain question answering system. So the closed domain question answering system is I take a, a body of text, a collection of uh, documents, and I figure out whenever I ask any question, the answer is inside this document. So this is a closed domain. Closed domain, limit the what you can say. And that give you it give the user more specific targeted answer, which is what you want, right? So cross domain design, 
is essentially use information retrieval, use the document retrieval. And that is what I briefly mentioned called the dense passage retrieval method. And that is used originally by the open domain, by the brand bottle one. The, um, but it's a smaller scale than the open domain chatbot. So you don't want to use open domain chatbot because it also incorporate humor, incorporate how to respond more funny in a more funny way, more empathetic. And that would take away your current uh, answer. The answer want to be, you want to be more business-like, more precise. So you, I think you only want to use half of the open domain chatbot architecture instead of the complete architecture. Okay, thank you. Uh, George was asking, how do you determine the saliency of context in long-term memory and short-term memory? For example, resolving the context of a pronoun in a question, is there a time limit? So I imagine, you know, if there's three sentences, five sentences, and the last sentence is he, you know, then the he will refer back to somebody named in a prior sentence. Um, so, you know, for example, resolve the context of a pronoun in a question, is there a time limit? Very good question. The, in general, uh, this is a co-reference resolution. So in this, uh, in general, uh, this is certainly has, you have to train the system to learn how to do this uh, with a lot of training data. The, as far back, so if you incorporate all the context from the current conversation, they are all part of the candidate. So ideally, the cross, the closest is the the one you prefer. You you rank them. You, the output essentially rank them, right, based on the probability. And then the training data will tell you which one is more likely to be the 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 reference, the entity. Now, uh, so the question is, how far do we go? The you go as far as you can with the uh, how much context you included. The it could be something from last week or last month in, in the long-term memory retrieval. That could happen too. Um, and that's why I believe this paper actually showed that, the, the Brandbot 2, 2.0 paper showed that how they do it. The, but it's essentially come down to training, come down to uh, data, how many data points you train to, for them to recognize that. Thank you. Sure. Uh, Tom uh, had a YouTube question uh, said, uh, of uh, Ty Dickerson. What are your thoughts on AI handling low risk contract negotiations with people um, based on company preset negotiation responses? What is my sort of building an AI bot for negotiation? Yeah, for low, low risk contract negotiation. So contract could be like, teacher in the union or something like that that's a or other contract negotiations so a chatbot that would be having contract negotiations with people um, based on uh, some company preset negotiation responses so the company said these are the kind of strategies and responses that we find acceptable um, yes that, that is actually creative. there are startups working on that i actually advised one startup doing that so, so you can negotiate uh, that they were, they were doing price negotiation or quantity negotiation. They were doing all supply chain ordering. So that is one simple contact, uh, contract negotiation. You can certainly do more complex negotiation, but once you have the domain set, the all the entities, all the important uh, aspect predefined, you can train, essentially train that like a task oriented dialogue system. So it's doable. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, 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 Stephen. Hi, Stephen. How is a soda on multi language input? Uh, state of the art. Multi language input? Yes. I so, think it's uh, uh, for, for what? For doing what? Multi language input for translation, for, for language understanding, for dialogue, for what? Uh, the, it was a very short sentence I'm reading. Uh, okay. Well, uh, so. multilingual is not an issue at all. Right now, it's a, a closed state of art is, uh, 
I, I believe uh, first of all, we already surpassed the human in many machine learning translation tasks now. So yeah, uh, it's solved. I believe it's a solved problem. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, an anonymous person, if you first train on task oriented data and then add pre trained conversation um, or pre trained, I'm sorry, conversion, uh, does this improve over task oriented alone? Yes, we found the pre training in your domain data definitely helps. It improve your vocabulary, improve the language pattern, and definitely you you do want to do additional pre-training if we, if you have those data. Okay. Yeah. Uh, from Tom, who shared a question from YouTube, uh, Jay was asking, what about curious chatbots that can discover new information by questioning a subject? Oh, curious chatbot, very interesting. You have to define the objective for the, so how do we train a curious chatbot is uh, they have to get an incentive to be curious. How do you make a chatbot curious is uh, if, uh, so you have to define the objective, right? Right now we are, our objective is to be as, as sensible, as accurate as possible. That's how we train the chatbot to optimize against that criteria. If you want to build a curious chatbot, then at every sentence, every turn, the chatbot asks new information, something new. Uh, maybe you can compare the answer to what's, what the chatbot already knows. So I believe the criteria is a little bit complex here. You have to- You'd have to have a reward function on newness of information. Right. That's not information you already have in your repository. Right. Um, yeah. And, and I wonder if you could come up with a surprise element, like something that contradicts what you might have estimated. Um, so there could be different elements of that. That's an interesting comment. Thank you, Jay. Yeah. Um, let's see. An anonymous uh, person was asking, let's see, uh, what do you think is the best open source text to speech system? The question um, Junling answered was speech to text, not text to speech so the question is asking about text to speech right correct yeah, yeah that, so, that's so a, having a computer read the text out loud kind of like yeah. an audiobook i know i know that part is the part i haven't done research that part i just leave to specific uh, researchers or company i think originally cmu was leading that text to speech but uh, google now uh, Certainly, yeah, I, I, I'm I not following text to speech. Somehow we just assume this part is the solve the problem yeah. <laughs> or given someone else doing that. that that's it's fair enough. It's always refreshing to hear a person say that's not my area of expertise. Um, that's not, yeah. yeah. Uh, so Thomas was asking regarding both ASR and TTS, text to speech, please check out NVIDIA Reva a platform for conversational AI offering several state-of-the-art modules. So I think this was less a question for you and just sharing with the audience. So I'll just repeat it back. Um, the suggestion was look at NVIDIA RIVA, R-I-V-A. Um, RIVA, R-I-V-A, okay. Yes, yes. And that's for both ASR and text-to-speech. So just to share that with everybody. Um, Thomas asked, how do you prevent your chatbot from providing toxic or offensive answers. Yeah, that's, uh, that's uh, the <laughs> problem we all face, right? Um, and part it, of that might be, you know, do you do things to filter out your training data, you know, to check for that um, so it doesn't learn it from the training data? Um, or is there other things you do? Yeah, so, Filter training data is part of the way to filter the offensive language. The, I think uh, that's definitely what we look at too. We definitely look at that. But uh, beyond that, even you have a perfect 
you can you even you have a perfect uh, say data without offensive words the output can still be offensive or even doesn't make sense to people so so that's a secondary thing you still need to worry about both i think uh, definitely start filtering training data is important maybe and this is just a brainstorm suggestion that with any background but perhaps if you can provide a feedback uh, you know like if the chatbot was to give some response and there's a little button say this was offensive then you could give some that would give some labeling as to what people might perceive as offensive and then you could iterate and at least identify on a scalable fashion um so kind of like a variation of a spam filter where most email comes in and it's valid except for the ones you mark as spam and then you can do something about it so that's one idea great idea definitely yeah okay so that was all the things in the q a i'll go back to the chat uh let's see um uh, jai was asking can this be applied to information search like customers searching for information on a co company support and services page yes so a lot of chat about it was uh, designed for uh, as an interface for search for information in fact there are a couple of startups just announced to do that to help company easily find information the uh, let me share with you the early the retrievals component in here so the information what is information search is a given a query you find a relevant document and the reason it didn't do well in the current uh, company context is uh, we don't have a signal like google has with with user links those uh, hyper hyperlink uh, the the google ranking model right so uh, so here the you can you can train a uh, end to end system with bird inside how to organize how to rank the documents so we, this is called a dense passage retrieval the and the combine that with uh, with the BART, you can do cross domain question answering. You can also do open domain question answering. So the difference is here, the cross domain is limited to your company documents. Okay, thank you. Uh, sure. Let's see, Tom posted a question from YouTube. Uh, oh, that was the uh, curious chatbots, I read that. Let's see, um, Lisa, Eliza Loop was asking, does training data set have to be created in advance or can results of chats be converted into training data? Um, training data is labeled by human. That's what we call training data. So you normally it's pre-prepared to train. You, if you have a new conversation, you save that, you, you send it to human to label and then that become your training data. So it's not in the real time. The training definitely is not in the real time. Certainly. Thomas was asking, uh, will this recording be available? So that's a general ACM. Uh, so and the question answer for that is, uh, yes, we're doing a Zoom recording and we'll uh, upload this to the YouTube channel. Um, and that should be in uh, hopefully a, a day or two, uh, but not likely very long. Um, and then ACM Local said, yes, the recording will be available. We'll announce it on the meetup. Uh, let's see. Uh, Thomas was asking, saying, regarding the ASR NVIDIA, recently released very interesting models as part of the NVIDIA Riva product. I think that was discussed before. Um, and then, uh, let's see. Carl was um, asking, how much do the humans get trained to adjust to the limitations of the system? I like that question. So, so like the person using the chatbot, how much is a chatbot training the person, the people <laughs> to deal with the limitations? It's kind of like in the old days with a Palm Pilot using graffiti, you kind of got trained into yeah. the limitations of the system. Yeah, for most the task oriented system, they were never limited. The open domain now is approaching human like conversation. So you can say anything. You don't have to worry about the. Uh, 
just click. Oh, so so you don't have to worry about the um, the style how you speak with task oriented dialogue system. It's uh, still limited. So maybe human trying to say, but what I we observe is human are not really too limited by they still say whatever normally they want to say. So it's hard to train human, much harder. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, Tom was uh, saying, if the chatbot learns from successful con men, will it become one? I if think we'll, a, tongue, a tongue in cheek question. Tom was asking, if the chatbot learns from a successful con man, uh, it will, will become a will con, become con one. man. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that they can definitely fool you. Yeah. Uh, so we don't need any more of that. We need to believe what we see on the internet and have it be more factual and reliable. I would, that's my vote, but who am I? Uh, uh, posting from Tom on a YouTube question. Um, so, uh, do you maintain context in a conversation? Yes, so, the context we mentioned, all the previous context, right? Previous conversations, the context. Sure. Okay, so we've gone through all the questions in the chat. One more came up in the Q&A uh, from an anonymous person. When a company switches from human agents to computer chatbot, does computer satisfaction go up, down, or stay the same? Very good uh, question. Certainly, uh, the interface may not as smooth as a human. That could be frustrating. On the other hand, the accessibility increase, right? You like um, at the 2 a.m. at night, you are able to chat, right? You want to get something, some information out of the interaction. Maybe you want to check your status. So all this. Uh, so combining the easiness of interaction with the the like smoothness of interaction, it's a, it's a combined skill, right? So we do have a new measurement called the uh, we call MACS. Uh, I forgot the acronym stands for, but essentially it's combining the user satisfaction in a multiple way. Okay. Um, and then uh, this is a question for me, Greg. Um, so are there some places that use chatbots at first line of Q&A and then with some kind of escape word, can I talk to a real person? Um, so are there different ways of integrating the chatbot to the real person or handling that transition? Yes. Um, yes. And that is a very active uh, research and uh, practice area we do use uh, some method to transfer the once so for example you can use the speech recognition to detect the frustration you can use the word to detect the frustration and uh, that's uh, we take a proactive way to transfer to human agent you or you can just allow the user to initiate that okay um and then there was a question about job titles uh, can you address whether there's a real difference between job titles like data scientist, data analyst, data engineer? Oh yeah, they are very different. So data scientist is the person trained in machine learning. They typically with a PhD in computer science or master in computer science. Data analyst could be trained in statistics or uh, mathematics. Data data analyst is doing more analyzing data so they don't program they, their code doesn't go into production their data analyst is uh, building dashboard uh, analyzing the impact of a certain kind of uh, certain kind of data on company on or on the uh, training data so, and the data engineer is working on infrastructure typically is how to build a machine learning pipeline how to deploy bird model in gpu in cpu and how can make it scalable so so that's data engineer but data scientists are the people who understand the bird understand the natural language uh, basically understand how transformer works how to apply transformer that is uh, what the data scientists do okay and then also on the 
the chat section, I added a couple of links I was familiar with. Um, at different data mining conferences, there's a workshop series, Initiative for Analytics and Data Science Standards, IADSS. And so if you go to that uh, website, um, then there's uh, some discussion about that, um, IADSS. And then I also listed, uh, there is a, a Harvard Business Review article on toward foundations for data science and analytics, a knowledge framework for professional standards. So that's kind of defining the different data science roles. Um, and that was by some of the people in the IADSS. Um, and I'm, I'm on that uh, committee. And also with uh, Birchworks, they do a data science salary survey. And they define different data science roles that they group together for their salary survey. And they talk about some of the differences. Um, Can I follow up with that? Sure. Gentling, uh, uh, in your slide here, your last slide, you have, uh, you're hiring data scientists of all levels. When you say data scientists of all levels, do you also, are you sort of implying that you're also hiring uh, data engineers, data analysts, that type of thing? Oh, no, no, no. I, I just mean junior, the young new graduates, and then people work for one year, two year, people work for five years. That's, that's what I meant, all levels. Okay, but that also could be include a person transitioning from one, one career into data science. Um, what I would like is the person at least with well trained in data science. So even the junior, it's more about the work experience, the level means. Sure. Okay. And then a, a question in chat from Donald. Um, what are the best references to learn the basics of BERT, BART, and GPT-3? Is there anything like a good Transformers 101 intro tutorial, perhaps? There are lots of Transformer tutorial on the internet. So if you just search for Transformer tutorial, you can easily find uh, several articles. There are many good, it's not on top of my head um, because it's a long, like toward the data science is a very good website, has many good articles. Only uh, In addition, <clears throat> on TensorFlow website, there are tutorials. So basically a Google, Google website, they have Google research website, have tutorials on Transformer. They ha you can even download their collab code to play with their transformer. So that help you to step inside, step by step, how the encoder was built, how the decoder was built. And so that, that uh, tutorial was written by Google itself. Uh, easy way, the simple way is uh, go to the GitHub, Google GitHub. Uh, there is a transformer uh, directory and you can just check out their source code. And that's the easiest way to see but they do have a tutorials in the in the TensorFlow website. And then I saw in the chat box, Arsha and Thomas pasted a couple of links. Um, since this chat will go away after the meeting, um, at the end of the meetup, there's a discussion section where people can post. I would ask if you could maybe repost your links there, and other people in the future may be interested. Uh, is that a question for me? Uh, no, I was uh, speaking to oh. the people who posted on the chat window, Harsha and Thomas. Uh, so thank you for the contributions and answering some of the questions. Um, from ACM Chicago, what about chatbots that get answers from enterprise databases? Have you worked with translating the question into a SQL query, which runs on a SQL database, return the answer, and then express it back to the chatbots? Yes, there are uh, the program called the code T Salesforce build a chatbot like that. It's called the code T5. Use T use T5 model to build a code generation. Um, you can write this is GPT three does the same thing. You can generate a SQL code. So if you use a natural language to say something, they convert it to a SQL query for you. Excellent. Well, I think we've had uh, a good several dozen questions going on here, but it looks like uh, they've slowed down. So um, ACM, anybody else want to make any other announcements or, or speak to anything? I might be uh, wrapping up the meeting. Okay. 
Well, um, everybody, if you haven't, get, get a screenshot of Jun Ling's um, uh, email. And please uh, feel free to get in touch with her. Uh, she's hiring. And so uh, please reach out to her and help her make this a, a successful talk for her in many ways. So thank you very much, Julie, and we'd uh, be happy to have you back in the future. Thank you, Greg. Thanks, everyone. Thank yeah. you, Jun Ling. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay, I'm going to... Bye now.